Hello everyone, welcome to today's class. And in today's class, we are going to talk about the governance issues in professional individual sports. In previous lectures, we have spent time to look at um, how professional team sports being organized in the United States and also how professional sports league in Europe has been organized and has been governance. So in today's class, we're going to look at how professional individual sports. In particular, we are going to focus two sports, tennis and golf, to see how professional tennis and how professional golf has been organized. Okay. So to begin with, um, I want you to go and think about what are the similarities and differences uh, between professional team sports and professional individual sports in terms of the business models, uh, governance. So what are the similarities and differences in these two areas? So you may come up with a lot of different idea. Um, the first topic we're going to talk about it today is we look at the similarities and differences between professional individual sport and professional team sports. So basically, we try to understand what may professional in this, uh, individual sport unique in terms of their business models and governance. Right? So there are four things we would like to emphasize. Right? For the professional individual sports, um, they has been organized as a tour, right? So if you look at tennis, we have a ATP tour, we have WTA tour, right? Um, when we look at golf, we have PGA tour, we have LPGA tours, right? We have so many different types of golf tours, these things um, in the professional golf industries, right? So that's the first thing difference. How about professional team sports? Um, so professional team sport has been organized as a league, right? We talk about we have a professional league organizations, which is the top topic we talked about last week. But the second things, um, the second thing made professional individual sports unique is they have multiple governing bodies involved. As we look at professional team sport, they normally have a one main governing bodies involved, either MFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, or English Premier League. Spanish La Liga, they have a one governing bodies, right? They basically set the schedule uh, for the whole seasons. They set the rule in terms of what teams will be um, staying in this level and what team will be delegated in the lower divisions um, using European soccer as examples, right? So they have only one main governing bodies involved. As we look at professional individual sport, they are different, right? They have a uh, multiple governing bodies involved, right? Uh, we're using uh, tennis as examples, right? Tennis has uh, three main governing bodies, ATP, which is a men's professional tennis associations, WTA, which is a women's tennis association. They also have ITF, which is an international tennis federation. So they have a multiple governing bodies involved. Uh, so multiple governing bodies need to collaborate with each other uh, to make sure you know, those events has been organized uh, effectively, right? Uh, golf is the same, right? They have a USGA, United States Golf Association, and uh, you have uh, RNA, which is another main governing bodies in golf, and in the between they also have a PGA Tour, a PGA of Americas, and all other types of the um, business involved, right? They also have an international golf association, which is brand new a golf association that was just created. Not that long ago, the purpose is to try to you know, organize the golf tournaments uh, during the Olympic Games. So those are the second thing's difference. The third thing difference is a tour normally stop uh, at the various size for the events. Right? So tennis players, golf players, they don't have a home venues. Right? So they have to travel all year long for different types of competition. They have to play in different types of field. Right, professional team sports are different. They have a home event. They also have away games, right? And so those are the third difference. And the last difference, which is also the most significant difference, is professional individual athletes. They are self employees, so they don't sign contract with a particular teams, right? Instead, they normally sign a contract with the governing bodies. So like PGA players, right, they get the PGA tour cards directly from the PGA, so they sign a contract with uh, the governing bodies, right, tennis players the same, ATP, 
men's tennis players to sign a contract with ATP, you would not commit to this event organized by the ATP, right? So they're sell employees, right? They don't sign contract with the particular teams. They don't receive salaries like professional team athletes. They receive salaries on monthly basis, right? So how could a professional individual athletes make money? So they're based on two things. The first thing is the price money, right? So they participate in different types of competition. The better result they achieve, um, they will have more opportunity to win higher price monies. Right. The second thing is for the individual events, they also going to provide appearance fee for those top athletes. Right. If you're going to organize like a lower levels of golf tournaments, but you won't have these most well known athletes come here to participate in events, um, you have to pay them appearance fee. That's another big revenues for these individual athletes. Right. Here is a table show you in the two thousand seventeen, the ten highest paid athletes in the world. You find out there are a lot of individual athletes, but the individual athletes in tennis, in Roger Federer, right, in golf you have uh, Roy McIlroy, right, right. You also have um, F1 racers, Lewis Hamilton's, right. You look at those individual athletes, right. So in addition to the salary, they also generate a lot of revenue from endorsements, right, Roger Federer. Um, he only won six million dollars in the salary in the price monies, um, but they he he got sixty eight million dollars endorsement deals in that particular year, right? You can see endorsement is also a big part of the salaries that has been received by the in professional individual athletes. Okay, so those are four main differences. And my question here is, what are the similarities between professional sports league and professional individual sport? Can you think about some similarities? So overall, I would say the business models are very similar. All right. So both professional individual sport and professional team sport, right? They all determine players' performance or teams' performance based on ranking, right? Professional individual athletes, tennis player, golf player, right? So golfer, they all have their rankings, right? They have world rankings based on their world rankings. Uh, they will determine what kind of competition they can participate. Uh, right, team is the same. Right, team professional team, uh, event is the same. Right, they use a ranking to determine a team's performance. Right, that's the first thing. Second thing, um, is a player have a very deeply involved in the governing structures. Right, professional team athlete they have a player association. Uh, player individual athlete they also have a player association, and they actually play a bigger roles in the decision making process. So we'll talk a little bit about it later on. And the third thing is globalization actually have a huge impact on both professional individual athlete, uh, individual sport and professional team sports. Right. So for instance, the event now has been scheduled all around the world. You know, tennis players, the whole year, they're going to play multiple different tournaments in different countries and different tennis um, venues. Uh, golfers is the same, right? You, you're playing PGA Tour, you play different events. Um, some golfer would like to participate in the events in Europe. So they have a PGA European Tour, right? So a lot of different um, events has been scheduled in different places in the world. And the second thing is um, the athletes, right? If you look at professional team, professional sports league, uh, we have a lot of time we consider professional sports league are domestic sports league but you have a lot of international players participate that can help you to improve the levels of the competition. Right? Individual sports are the same, right? You have players from all around the world playing the same events. Right? Sponsors, you have global sponsors for all around the world. Right? And also you have a fan base. You should attract a fan base because you have players from all around the world, so you'll be able to attract more fan base. And also the international broadcasting coverage is also the event not just being watched by particular markets, but also going to watch by uh, the fans for all around the world. So those are the similarities, how the globalization have impact on both professional team sports and professional individual sports. Okay, so in today's class, we are mainly going to focus on golf and tennis. So we're gonna talk about tennis first and then talk about golf later and then we'll talk about some of the major issues involved into 
in the professional individual sport. So I don't know how many of you are following golf on a daily basis, right? So we talk about golf uh, uh, tennis on a daily basis. So uh, we talk about tennis have three main governing bodies, right? ATP, um, the full name is Association of Tennis Professionals. So those are considered as a men's professional tennis associ association. And WTA um, referred to um, women's tennis association that mainly collaborated with those top female tennis players. And ITF, which is International Tennis Association, right? Um, so three of them have their very different roles. ITF, so they basically standardized the rule for tennis. So tennis was actually started in uh, 19th centuries in Europe first, right? People started playing tennis, um, but they have different types of rules. So when ITF was founded, and so the first thing ITF did was they standardized all the rules for the tennis. And the tennis became professional sport in 1968. Um, currently, uh, you possibly know uh, that tennis um, had four major Grand Slam events, right? Uh, we have Australian Opens, normally has been played in January. Um, you have uh, Roland Gauss, normally play in um, May, the end of May. Right. And you have one Bowden normally play in the beginning of um, June, and also you have a U.S. Open normally play in the uh, in the end of the um, August and the beginnings of the September. So these are four major Grand Slam events. So these are four major Grand Slam events are now organized by all these governing bodies. So who are mainly responsible for organizing these four major Grand Slam events? So those major Grand Slam events are organized by their own country's tennis association. For instance, U.S. Open is organized by U.S. Tennis Association. Wimbledon is organized by British Tennis Associations. Right. Uh, French Open is organized by French Tennis Association. Australian Open, obviously, is organized by Australian Tennis Association. So they have been organized by their own country's governing bodies in tennis. Right, they don't organize by ATP, WTA, and ITF. But ITF normally oversee how those major Grand Slam has been taking place. And ATP and AWTA will collaborate with them to deliver this event because they have the player, right? Without player, the event would not be possible. So they have the best players in the world. They signed a contract with ATP and WTA. So they committed to this major event. So this is how those major events work, right? So organized by the uh, local tennis association in that particular country. Right, so those are four major Grand Slam events. So I'm not sure how many of you watch those events. You know, those events are different. Where Australian Open and US Open, they're playing the hardcore. Uh, Roland Gallos, you look at the logos here, they play on the claim, right? And one ball then they play on the grass. So normally, you know, you have different types of players. You know, some players are very good at hardcore. If you're good serve, normally you're good at hardcore. Um, if you have a good serve, Big sir, you get at the grass as well because the speed is going to be phenomenal, right? But some player from Spain in particular, um, they're very good at playing the claim, right? The, the ball is um, it's going to be very tricky. Um, so these are four major events, right, um, um, in, in professional tennis. And so in terms of governing body, we are mainly going to look at ITF and ATP, right? Um, ITF, as we talk about, is an international tennis federation. That's a primary governing bodies. So their main responsibilities are establishing the basic rule of the play, overseeing the Grand Slam events, and lower ranks professional circuits and the team events. So ITF, um, so basically if you're, you're a tennis player, so you start playing tennis, you want to become tennis players, a uh, uh, lot of time you start with playing the event organized by ITF first when you don't have a very high ranking you don't you're not the top 100 play, uh, top 100 player in the world so you more likely to play the event organized by ITF so ITF mainly organize this event that um, play mainly by this we we'll say um, early stage of the play, of professional players 
for those junior players, you're 13, 14 years old, you want to participate in some big events, so normally ITF organize that. But ITF also organize this Davis Cup and Feder Cup, which is a team event. Some of you have heard it. Davis Cup is a um, men's um, team's event. Feder Cup is men's uh, women's team's event. Right, look at ITF's um, organizational structure. Right, so basically, um, this is very similar to other business. They have uh, um, the council in different um, area. They're responsible for the different duty. They also work really closely with the regional tennis association and also USTA and Canadian um, tennis association. So, so this is how the structure work in professional tennis. ITF is the main governing body. They set the rule. Right, they organize the team event. They organize those um, the event for lower levels of professional players. Right, if you are top female players and top male players, so you collaborate more closely with ATP or WTA. So ATP is a men's professional tennis association. Right, so ATP was founded in nineteen seventy two uh, as a player association. Right. So for many years in the tennis world, most of these events were mainly organized by ITF. Right. However, um, due to the lot of the marketing of the organizations, so tennis was not as really well developed as it is today. Right. So in 1989, so ATP, which is a uh, association for the men's professional tennis players, so they talked to ITF, say we want to you know collaborate with you. And, but we want to deliver a brand new um, men's professional tennis tour. Right, starting from eight, 1989, um, so they started to organize an ATP tour. Right. Um, for the ATP, uh, the uh, main responsibilities are um, try to design these tournaments. Right. So the whole year we have 52 weeks. Right. So um, which tournaments will be taking place here in the United States, which play, uh, which tournaments will be taking place in Europe, so they're going to set that schedules. Give players the idea, say, hey, this week, how many tournaments are going on in the world, right? Which one I can play based on my rankings, right? So they set the schedules. Um, the second thing is also, they're also going to be determining the uh, ranking points, right? So if you look at the organizational structure, so they include three parts, uh, board of director, players' councils, and tournaments' councils. If you look at the board of director, so they have a chairman and CEO, they have directors, right? They also have a three players' representative be involved in the board of directors. So when you try to compare professional team sport and professional individual sport, right, because you look at the main governing bodies, uh, a player association with ATP is the player association, WTA is a women tennis players player association. So individual athletes, they have a greater powers and influence in that particular sports, right? Because they're deeply involved there into their governing bodies, into the decision making process. Right. So they actually play a bigger role. Right. So this is about ATP. Right. WTA is the same. Same structure, similar model, just mainly target for female uh, tennis players, right? So this is about ATP. So people possibly want to know if I am very interested in playing tennis, I'm good at it, I want to become Roger Federer on one day, what is the procedure like, right? So the procedure is like at the very beginning, when you're 13, 14 years old, you start to play and, you know, lower levels competition, most of this competition has been called future events. These future events are being organized by IT, uh, ITF, right? So with your rankings, what ranking has been improved, right? When you become top 200 players, right? Then you'll be able to play some of the event organized by the ATP or WTA, right? When you become top 100 players in the world, then you are qualified to play the four major grand slams. So you find out as a tennis players, you know, the levels of competition completely depend on their rankings. You know, the higher rankings you are, you'll be able to play in the higher levels of competition, which means you have better opportunity to get higher press monies. Where obviously grand slam, 
prize money is so much higher than other you know tennis events, right? So this is how the tennis work. And the second a part of the lecture we're gonna look at professional golf, right? Professional golf, um, their rules completely different from any other sport. Very complicated. So the future of the professional golf industry is the rule set by two governing body, USGA and RNA. RNA is the role in ancient golf clubs. So the rule is set by two governing bodies. Other sports, the rule normally set by one governing body. So even tennis, the rule set by ITF. Right, WTA and ATP just help the, the event to be organized by a professional player, but they don't set the rule for the games. Golf is different. Golf rules set by two major uh, governing bodies, U.S. Golf Association and Row in ancient golf clubs. Right, so unlike tennis, you may have only two major tours, right? You have ATP, WTA. Golf, you have tons of tour they have 20 plus professional tour it's in all around the world you have pga tour pga european tour lpga tours pga asia tours and pga australian tours pga japan tours sunshine tours a lot of people will be very confused hey we have so many different types of professional golf tour here so here in the united states we know pga tour is the main things right but if you're living other part of the world they care about different types of tour. So it have very different types of events involved. Unlike tennis, right, they mainly have a two tours. Golf, they have different types of tours. And similar to tennis, PGA, oh, sorry, professional golf is also having a four major events. This is what we call majors. We have, we have US Open, we have PGA Championship, we have Open Championships, which is also called British Open, and also we have the Masters. So these four events, they're organized by four different organizations. U.S. Open is organized by USGA. PGA Championships, organized by PGA of America. Right? So Open Championship is organized by RNA, golf clubs. So Royal and Ancient Golf Clubs. Master is organized by, organized by Augustana. Uh, golf clubs right so four events organized by four different organizations right so this is a big con uh, big pictures about what the professional golf industry looks like so we're mainly going to look at these governing bodies right the first one we look at USGA United, United States Golf Association and RNA. So they work, collaborate, work together to govern the sports of golf. Uh, for some of you, you, if you're familiar with the history of the golf, you know, golf was invented about 250 years ago in Scotland, right? So RNA, uh, which is a Royal and Ancient Golf Club of Andrew, was the first golf club existing in the world. So most of the rule in the past was basically decided by this golf club because they were the first one in the world, they invented this sport, so they set the rules. So uh, USGA was founded in 1894 after um, you, uh, the golf was developed in the United States and the, the, the golf rules here in the US are slightly different compared to the golf rules in the other part of the world. Right, so, and then uh, these two governing bodies started to collaborate together to decide to set the rule for the golf. So even until today, um, the the rule developed by RNA and the USGA, they have some slightly difference. Majority of the rule currently is the same, but there are like 2% of regulations are different. Right, so they also share their powers in the world. Right, USGA mainly responsible for golf de development in the United States in Mexico. Right. RNA is governing bodies of the Gulf worldwide, except the U.S. and Mexico. So RNA currently is overseeing 156 organizations from amateur and professional golf on behalf of over 30 million golfers in 143 nations in the world. Right. So this is how these two 
on governing body collaborate with uh, with each other. So USGA and RNA every year they update things called rule of the golf. This is the rule. They introduce player rules, playing rules. They introduce ball size, introduce clubs, like all the different rules they, they set. But they also cover the issues like price money, price, price limits, expense. There are all different kind of information has been introduced in this particular book. Right, so this book is introduced by USGA and RNA together. So when we look at two organizations separately, so USGA, it was founded in 1894. So their role is to uh, determine equipment standards and set the core rating systems. Right, there are tons of golf courses in the United States. In California, for instance, right, there are more than a thousand golf courses in California. So all the different golf courses, when you set up the core, so what kind of competition will be able to play in this kind of golf course? So those rules are set by USGA in the United States and set by USGA, right? So they also host 13 national championships, including US Open and US Women's Opens, right? Because USGA, they oversee all those professional golf tour in the United States in Mexico. So they oversee USA, uh, the oversee PGA Tour, so they oversee um, LPGA tour. They also oversee um, in the PGF America, right? So those are um, USGA's role. RNA, um, so they was founded in 2004. We talk about um, RNA initially, um, that was belongs to real and ancient golf clubs and Andrews, right? So but in 2004, they became a separate governing bodies, separate from the uh, golf clubs. Um, they become a governing bodies. So their job is to oversee um, the, all these professional golf tour in other part of the world, in addition to the United States and Mexico, right? That including European tour, um, they including Japan golf tour, including um, PGA tour in Australia, Fenshai tour, that's all different types of tour. They've been overseeded by RNA, right? So those rule between those two and those two are different. Right, RNA is also responsible for hosting one of the four majors, that's uh, British Open, Open Championships. Right, so these are the differences between USGA and RNA. And another pretty confused people is about the US. Um, there are two different things. One is a PGA of America and a PGA Tour. So PGA of America and PGA Tour are also different. Right, so initially, all those golf uh, all those golfers in the United States, so they all belong to PGA of America. So PGA of America was founded in 1916s, right? Initially, they was focusing on uh, professional instructions and golf management. However, you know, some of the golfers, uh, they are more interested in competing in higher levels of competition rather than teach people how to play golf, right? So the interest has separated them. So for some of those golf who want to compete, so they decided to organize uh, something called PGA Tour, separate themselves from the PGA of America in 1968, right, to operate the tournament and player divisions. So nowadays we have two separate uh, organizations here, PGA of America, they're still really focusing on the professional instructions and golf management, and PGA Tour, now they're focusing on professional play. Right, PGA of America, they host a four major championships, right, and also including one of the majors called PGA Championships. They also host the Raider Clubs. Some people might know Raider Club is a team event in golf. In the past, Raider Club was between US and England. Now, uh, the competition was between US and Europe, right? So it's like team competition every year taking place either in the US or in the Europe. For the PGA Tour, the more focused on professional play. So if you're a professional player, uh, you want to compete in the highest level, normally you play in the PGA Tour, right? So it has events like PGA Tour, Web.com Tour, PGA Tour China, PGA Tour Canada, and PGA Tour Latin America. So basically, if you're currently a golfer, right? So you graduate from university and you want to play in the professional golf, 
uh, PGA Tour. So you normally starting from those lower level competition first, PGA Tour of Latin America, Canada, and China. So if you become top 25, then you'll be able to play a high level competition called Web.com Tour. If you finish on top 25 in the Web.com Tour, you can get the tour card next year to play at the PGA Tour, which is the higher level competitions in professional golf. So this is how these tournaments are connected with each other. Right. So this is about the differences between PGA of America and PGA Tour. So the last topic we're going to talk about in this class is we're going to look at the competitive balance in the professional individual sport and some of the issues. Right, so what strategy has been utilized uh, in professional individual sports such as tennis and golf to enhance the competition's levels? Where there are three strategies we're going to talk about. First of all, they try to classify all the events to different levels. With the player with higher rankings, you're able to play in the higher levels of competitions. Player with the lower rankings, you're going to play a lower levels of competitions. So that's the first thing they do. Second thing is to have a seating, right? The seating is to separate the top player in the draw. So then they don't not they're not gonna meet in the early rounds of the tournament. So if you're gonna watch tennis, um, you find out they have bracket, right? The the bracket they have a bracket, right? So bracket normally separate those seed, right? You're number one, number two in the war, they normally not gonna play in the first round. So they're in the, in the different half. Right. The purpose is they try to make sure the best player they be able to play in the final. They can catch people's attentions. That's right. so using C to enhance the um, players' competitions. Right. And the golf is also very very similar. Right. Um, the, the the top finishers normally in the same group they play against each other's. Right. They made the competition become pretty intensive. And the third strategy in golf, I um, mean, is using making the cups to the top finishers. Um, so, uh, normally golf event, you know, there's a four days, first two days, they will set the cup, right? They eliminate some, um, unqualified players and making sure it's only player in the good shape going to be playing over the weekend. So those are the strategy has been introduced in tennis and golf to enhance the competitive balance. And what a major issue, we're going to briefly talk about three major issues. The first issue is about eco pay, right? Eco pay um, has been discussed in sports industries, um, not just in professional team sport, but also in professional individual sport. Uh, we know there are a lot of discussion about whether U.S. women's soccer team should be paid the same as the men's soccer teams, right? A lot of discussion, a lot of uh, lawsuits associated with that. In the tennis, uh, they started a conversation in 1960 and 1970, Billie Jean Games. She started with the conversation first, and at that time, that was a really famous um, male and female tennis competition at that time. Uh, Billie Jean Games showed the world that female player can play as well as male players. right? So that was a really um, great start. Um, so in the tennis, it's actually the only events in the world right now. Basically, male and female players are uh, are paid the same in the press money. So if you're going to play in the major tennis events right now, so there's no differences in the price money between male and females. Right, they started from the U.S. Open first. In the U.S. Open starting in 1973, male and female players got the same price money. But, um, French Open starting in 2001, Australian Open starting in 2006, Wimbledon, which was the last uh, Grand Slam event to offer the same press money, equal press money from both male and female players, right? So um, in four major events in tennis, male and female players are, are paid the same already. So there are a lot of discussion with a lot of arguments in terms of whether male and female should get the same pay or not. For the people who say male and female should not be paid the same, so their arguments are, first of all, if we're playing the uh, Grand Slam event, um, men, Male players, they play five sets, but female players, they only play three sets, right? So they say, well, since male players play longer, uh, play more games, male players should be paid more than female players, right? That's a one argument. The second argument, they say, well, if you go and watch Wimbledon, so Wimbledon charge more for tickets 
to the men's final than women's final. That really means like men's final is more important than women's finals. So male player should be paid higher than the female player. That's some of the argument. Uh, they say they shouldn't be paid the same. Right. And another argument they say, well, male and female players should be paid the same. Uh, one thing from an ethical perspective, uh, female player, they work as hard as male player. So they deserve to get the same price money. The second thing is we look at tennis business models, right? Grand Slam event is the event that combine both male player and female player. So for all these Grand Slam event, they promote these players equally, right? They sell this broadcast right is because the te television will broadcast both male and female player. So hard to separate them, hard to separate them. And you're hard to, to say who actually contribute more than the others. So if you look at that business model, so it makes sense why um, in the professional tennis, male and females are ab able to get the same price money when they compete in the competition because they are playing the same competition. Right? If you look at tennis, uh, you, when you look at golf, golf, they cannot let male and female play in the same tournament, but tennis, they are. They are able to compete in the same tournaments. Right? So, so for the business models, it really has huge impacts on um, the equal pay has been uh, implemented in the professional tennis industry. So that's the first issue. The second issue we're gonna talk about the ranking system. So um, tennis and golf, they're all using a ranking system to determine the player's quality. Um, so in tennis, so all the players, they have accumulated points earned in the last 52 weeks to determine the world rankings. And however, um, one of the problem for this world ranking system is if the player got injured, like he, he might be out for six months. When he come back, his ranking will be down significantly, right? Maybe you were world number one in the world, but six months later, because you're losing six months points, right? So when you come back to the events from the injury, maybe your ranking is uh, like top 70s in the world. Right, which means you'll not be able to play in high levels competition, right? So how are you gonna adjust that issues? And also for the female players, like a lot of female players may have to go, uh, when they're playing tennis, maybe they're giving birth, right? When they're having a baby, so they will be out for about at least a year, right? So how you be able to protect this particular athlete for that particular knee? So they, so they introduce something called ranking protection rules. So basically they talk about each player, you are able to use that ranking protection rule twice in your career. So for instance, maybe you currently work, currently is uh, number 10 in the world, but you got injured, you're out for an entire year. When you come back to the tournament, you still can be considered as the top 10 players in the world and join these competitions. Right, so these are ranking protection rules. Try to protect this player who suffer from injuries and other um, personal issues. Right, so this is about ranking system. So the last problems issue we're gonna talk about is that there's a lot of internal conflict between governing bodies in tennis and golf. We talk about they have more than one governing bodies involved. Right, since you have more than one governing body involved, they have a conflict of interest. So using tennis example, so ITF and ATP, they have a lot of conflicts internally. So ITF, they have a Davis Cup with their team events, right? So last year, they have the team event, they reorganized the team events, uh, become uh, like a tournament, looks like a, a form, format is very similar to FIFA World Cup Finals. So they reorganized that. And the ATP, it also hosts a very similar event three months later, exactly the same events, it's also team events. So a lot of tennis players are complaining about it, say, what is the point for me to play two similar team events and just within the three months, right? So, so tennis players are very confused. Why do I have to play the similar events um, that are organized by two different governing bodies, right? So that's a one big discussion in tennis. A lot of conflict needs to be solved among the governing bodies. In golf, it's the same, right? We talk about PGA Tour and PGA European Tour basically at the highest levels of competition right now in the world. Right, but a lot of players uh, from the PGA Tour, they say, well, uh, PGA European Tour, their competition level is slightly lower than us. 
but the player can get the same points, which means their world ranking will be higher than us if we compete in the same levels of competitions, right? So that's unfair. So that's a lot of discussions involved um, about the internal conflicts between organi uh, governing bodies. So those are the three main issues uh, we talk about in the professional individual sport. Okay. So this is a lecture for the professional individual sport and some of the government issues. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please shoot me an email and let me know. Right, so I will uh, talk to you guys next time. Bye. Oh, the fuck?